banks are over leveraged again. This is very similar to 2008. Uh, the banks are over leveraged. We're starting to see war not warnings. We're starting to see uh, reassuring from people that the banks are strong. In fact, some economists can say the banks are strong and healthy. And I go, okay, I think they're dramatically over leveraged. I think that the scam system that we run, the, the fractional banking, where they can lend out 10 times what they take in on deposits. I think China may be putting their finger on the scale along with Bill Gates, trying to accumulate in the farmland. Because remember, if you ain't got food, all the money in the world ain't gonna help you. And I think that the gold silver ratio is gonna get way, come way down. I mean, it was at one time at 92. Okay, it's supposed to be the original terms were 15. So I think somewhere in between there will be. But I would, I would think silver is going to outperform gold, but I think they're both going to do pretty well. And I would not be surprised to see silver get into the mid-30s by the end of the year. Hey guys, welcome to Capital Cosm. Today we've got Todd Horowitz making his debut on the show. Todd, thank you for coming on, my friend. It's, it's great to be here. Always a pleasure to, to help educate the public. Yeah, Todd. So for people who may not know who you are, kind of give us a background into your investing journey. What brought you into investing? What brought you into gold, silver, commodities, et cetera? Well, it all started back in, in the late 70s when I was working for Pitney Bowes. I was a young guy. And uh, in those days, they could tell you were too young to be promoted. And when they told me that, I tell them to take the job and shove it. And of course, I knew some guys that were on the trading floor. So I became a member of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange in 1980. And I've been a member of all three exchanges in Chicago and still trade for myself every day. And I've only, only traded my own money since 1980. So I still trade every day. Uh, I still not, but I do now educate because there's more time. It used to be go to the train floor and go play golf now because I got to watch the screens all the time. I don't have as much freedom. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you've probably been trading longer than I've been alive. Probably 45 years. So that's, yeah. I think you're probably a little bit younger than that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be correct. <laughs> Wait, what is your general take on the markets at the moment? Things are all over the place. You've got gold making new all-time highs, oil sitting at $85 or so. Markets are down, broadly speaking. Well, what's your take here? Oh, Danny, I think the markets are in a lot of trouble. Now, again, I, I, just to be clear, I have an opinion, which I will give, but I will also disclose where I sit with my positions in the market so you understand. Because I, I may, I've been saying for about the last year that I expect a 50 to 60% haircut to the equities, okay? However, I'm always long in my retirement account because I use derivatives to hedge against the, those positions. And intermittently until last week, we had been long most of the time. So, you know, right now we're short. And I do think that that we're, we're in a lot of trouble. I thought it was interesting. And I think this is something that everybody can take note of. You know, we had a lot of problem on Friday in the Middle East. And I was on actually Liz Clayman at the afternoon, and she says, well, what are you going to do about the, the war in Israel? And I said, well, there's nothing to do. The markets have already told us that there's a problem because they got hammered Friday, if you remember. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if the markets rallied on Monday. And of course, if you looked, Sunday night they opened, they opened much higher, and they were higher all the way until today when out came what Israel response may be, and that sudden the market's off selling. But I think that you're going a lot lower. And I think the whole rally that we've watched was built on interest rate cuts. Now, you know, you're a pretty bright guy, young, you're around, exuberant, Danny, and you know what's going on. And there's no way that they can legitimately cut interest rates right now because inflation is still skyrocketing. No matter what they tell us, it's still high. Okay. You're paying a lot more for gas. You're paying a lot more for groceries. The 10-year notes are now 464. Okay. They're going to five, probably six, probably 7%. They can cut rates either because it's a political move or because we're going into a depression. If they cut rates because they get pressured by the market, that is the worst excuse, and they can't do that. So at the end of the day, we're past the rate hike, the rate cutting cycle, and there's a higher probability that there'll be a rate hike now. So as we look at it, if high rates are going higher, what's that going to do to the real estate market, which is overpriced? What's that going to do to the equity market, especially the big five that are extremely overpriced right now? It should create a sell-off. And the fact of the matter is, is you if you're an investor, you look at the big the big story. The big story is that the stock market has been up an average of 8.5% year over year for 200 years. And that's what you're playing. You buy good companies. You don't sell them. You don't panic out. You let them trade. If you're a trader, then you obviously trade in much shorter time frames. You're looking for opportunity. And right now, I mean, as much as I'm short and as much as I'm bearish the market, I would not be surprised at all if we see a pretty sharp rally in the next day or two. 
Interesting. So you mentioned the rate hiking cycle that we're presently in. You don't see any rate cuts down the pike. Uh, just actually about a month or so, but maybe a little less than then, Biden came on the scene and said that to expect a rate cut about a, a month after um, that it, that he anticipated, about sometime in June or July. A week after that, interestingly enough, um, Fed Chairman Powell came on the scene and said, no, we're not cutting rates anytime soon. So it seems like there's this tug and pull between the White House and the Fed there. Have you noticed this as well? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, you listen, presidents like to get, you know, they're not supposed to mix in. You know, for those who are not aware, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation owned by the banks. Okay. People get confused. And the reason they named it the Federal Reserve is they wanted to associate with the government. And their only real job is jobs and price stability, nothing else. But of course, they've way branched since Alan Greenspan, the greatest bu bubble builder of all time, started building these bubbles years ago it's become much more of a political spot as well. And of course, every president wants them to keep rates lower because it keeps the economy rolling in good and bad times because it leaves more access to money and more easy to borrow. But right now you can't. And now if you look at the, the credit card debt that is out there, never in history have we had this many people, the dollar amount is unimportant because of inflation, but we've never had this many people that had at least one credit card at the limit that they're paying the minimum of. So another problem, and of course, the higher rates go, credit cards are already charging usury rates to begin with, right? So we have to look at the overall picture. So there is no way that they can cut. But of course, Biden would like to cut because he'd like to see a market rally. He doesn't want to see a big sell-off into an election because election years, historically, 65% of the time, markets are higher during an election year. Yeah. So you, to kind of dovetail into you you mentioned the 50 to 60 percent haircut uh, that you see in the market is that because of the war in the middle east is that sort of the catalyst behind it or was this kind of baked into the cake even before the this whole story between iran and israel the, the middle east it has no bearing on what i'm thinking I, I think in my opinion okay the banks are over leveraged again this is very similar to 2008 uh the banks are over leveraged we're starting to see War, not warnings, we're starting to see the reassuring from people that the banks are strong. In fact, some economists can say the banks are strong and healthy. And I go, OK, I think they're dramatically over leveraged. I think that the scam system that we run, the, the fractional banking, where they can lend out 10 times what they take in on deposit. You know, think about that. They borrow from the emergency lending window, let's say a million dollars. OK, they can turn that liability into an asset and then they can lend out 10 times that, which is actually creating 10 more million dollars of new money, which is one of the biggest causes for inflation is new money that continues to flow in. And again, I think they're severely over leveraged because the, they, uh, the government allowed them to go far past the 10 to one and 10 to one is too high. OK, and that's if they're showing a true balance sheet. I believe, in my opinion, again, is if they allowed a true auditor to go in and look at these banks without that ridiculous stress test they give, you would find out that these banks are in a lot of trouble. And I think that we're going to see the end result of that. Again, when? I don't have that answer, but I think it's going to be sooner than we think. Yeah, there was an article published from Bloomberg a week ago where they said that the FDIC was ready and prepared for a major bank to collapse. Not that they're expecting it, but that kind of tells me that they are expecting it if they're prepared and if they're telegraphing that kind of narrative. What, what's your take there? Well, I, I mean, I happen to think that's the truth. I mean, again, I, I think that we, we, we built a society that we made things too easy for everybody to get money. You know, it's just like you watch a commercial now and improve your credit score by doing this, not by paying back a bill, but by doing something that uh, pushes your credit score higher. So what it does, is it allows the banks to loan out more money. And again, at some point, now the banks, the, one thing everybody has to remember is that the banks only need 40% of their people to pay back, right? It's 60% stiff, but 40% pay, they're still making money. But isn't a great business model when the banks know that the Federal Reserve is going to bail them out if there's a problem? Now, this is where I have a problem because I felt in 2008, they should have let the weak banks fail and bail out the depositors, not the banks. Why should we let, what, what kind of business do we have when we allow you to, extend and make a fortune and if you make a mistake okay we'll bail you out so you can make a fortune again so i do think that the banks are in a lot of trouble and i think that that will be the catalyst because i think that'll affect the housing market and you you watch housing i mean housing was like more liquid than stocks for a few days you can buy them and sell them like nothing 
Okay. Unfortunately me, I'm stuck with a house I can't sell right now. <laughs> so yeah, likewise. I, so I got three houses. One I'm trying to get rid of, I can't get rid of it yet. But again, I, I think that the banks are, are have really damaged the system. And I think that this is the, the SVP bank last year was just a, a forewarning that has been totally ignored by everybody. And I think you're going to see a lot of problems going forward. Yeah, I, I like the fact that you mentioned the 2008 bailout there because it essentially incentivizes bad risk taking and behavior. In situations like that, you need what's something that's called creative destruction. So that kind of cleanses the system out from any bad actors, businesses. It punishes the uh, the bad risk takers, and then it allows room for more vibrant competition to come on in and actually learn from the mistakes of those before them. But if you don't allow for that to happen, you're just going to keep seeing more and more of the same. I so. could agree with you more. That, listen, this is the problem that we've been having since Alan Greenspan, which created the internet bubble of the 90s, okay, and created the other bubbles, that the housing bubble of the of 2000s, and the new bubble, whatever this is going to end up being. Uh, but again, you cannot reward bad actors. You cannot reward those who, who do things wrong, they need to go out of business. And you need to, the, the whole, this is the problem that we have now in this country in general, Danny, is that there's the, the, the wiping out of competition, okay? Competition makes it for, for better product, better pricing, and better America. When you destroy competition, very much like Facebook and Google are doing, you know, they, they both went to Congress when they got to the size that were so big and they wanted regulations put on their industries. Why? because they wanted to keep competition out so they could control the markets. This is the problem that we that people don't realize. And if you keep looking for things, and you keep saying, well, it doesn't affect me. Well, eventually it's going to affect you. And by the time it affects you, it's going to be too late to do anything about it. That's where the problems come in. And this is why we're in, in the mess that we are right now. Yeah. And oftentimes people that do notice what you're referring to there about the lack of competition, this kind of quasi monopoly, they tend to get to give all of the blame to the corporations who do deserve a bit of the blame there. But it's the government that enables their their monopoly to begin with by giving them special rights and etc. So like I don't with, blame with the corporations. Google, well, I, I'll be clear with you. I do not blame them at all. In fact, if I was one of those corporations, I want to make as much money as I could do. Right. You know, I don't have, I don't begrudge Steve Jobs for being a billionaire from building Apple. He built it in his garage. He built a better product. Build a better product, build a comparison, and you'll do something. But the facilitation of government is exactly what you're saying. They always want to blame big business, but they facilitate big business. I mean, this is the, you know, the, the billionaires don't pay enough taxes, but let us facilitate you on the other side so that you can make more billions of dollars, right? Again, we, we've destroyed in this country, in America, competition, which is a horrible place to be in because the person, the people that really get hurt are the middle class line, get crushed by all the things that are going on, which again, is why we only have about 15% of the population that's investing in the markets right now to begin with. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the housing market just a second there ago. Uh, everyone seems to be stuck with their super low mortgage rate they got in 2020 and 2021. Uh, what's your take on the housing market? Is Are further rate hikes going to pop this bubble in your view? Or is simply the fact that so many people are just trapped with their mortgages? Is that kind of a, is that kind of a, uh, a blockade um, from further downside consolidation? Well, I think it's an interesting question and an interesting cycle. And funny, I, I play a lot of poker. I live in Las Vegas and my afternoon activity is playing a lot of poker. So I talked to a lot of people in the housing market and the guy said, no, there's not going to pop. I said, that's the perfect answer I want because I know this has got to pop, right? Because again, I, for example, personally, I've got three mortgages, okay? My mortgages are under 3%. And the last one I just took, and the only reason I made this deal to move is because the builder locked in Two and a half percent for the first year, three and a half percent for the second year, and a cap at four and a half percent forever. Okay, so for me that's like free money. Okay, so I'm willing to do that. And in fact, I had my homes paid for. I took the money out because I can make more money trading with that money than I am paying for the interest rate. But now you take the price, the, the interest rates up, and in Las Vegas, interest rates are on seven and a half percent for a mortgage. Okay, seven and a half percent people can't afford it. So now all of a sudden, the value of your house that you borrowed up to the hilt based on the low rate is now worthless because the buyer can't pay it because the buyer can only pay X amount per month. 
So if I can pay three thousand a month, three years ago, three thousand a month might have bought me a six hundred thousand dollar home. Today, three thousand dollar a month is going to buy me a four hundred fifty thousand dollar home. Same home, so it became a game of money instead of a game of actually buying a house. In the days of you know when people grew up, your, your dream, the American dream, was to own a home. That was kind of like your retirement savings. When you got to retirement age, you had a lot of equity in your house. You'd sell your house. You'd buy a smaller house. You'd have money plus your retirement. That no longer exists because too many people try to flip houses. They push them up to ridiculously priced, high price houses. I mean, I can't believe the house that I have. I'm I'm switching. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm trading my house for a house twice the size of it for an even exchange with the equity that I built up in the house I have here. Now again. That's, that is nuts when you really think about it. But that's why I couldn't pass it up because I'm a trader and it makes sense to me. Yeah. So did you see that story a couple of days back about the AT&T building in St. Louis being sold for about $4 million, if I remember correctly? Uh, what's your take on commercial real estate? It has the Have we bottomed out there or is there still more room to go? I don't think they're ever going to bottom, Danny. I, I think this is a, here's the here's the problem of COVID. This is the problem of a a a government that took advantage of a situation. They've destroyed the the, met, the metropolitan areas of where people go for business because people don't have to go to the office anymore. And if they have to go once a week, I don't need this big elaborate office anymore, right? So only the businesses that have to be in person are where people go all the time. So I, listen, I don't think commercial commercial real estate is going to zero. But I don't think you're going to see the same value nor the same rents because they're not. There's no longer the demand. They're allowing people to work remotely. You know, they're allowing people. Even travel hurts from that too. Even the hotel business hurts from that because again, it's the same reason they learned that they can do things remotely. You know, I've done a lot of TV in my life over the years, and they used to force me to come to a studio, right? Now, and I said I'm putting my own studio in, which I did, okay, in Chicago. And, and then they said, okay, that was fun. That, it's a good, it's good. Now they accept Skype. Now they accept anything. So again, it's the whole changing of what they've done. So it hurts not only that industry, but it hurts all the industries surrounding around it, travel, hotels, metropolitan areas. So it makes it bad for everybody because of what they've done and how they destroyed the economy. But now it's more the norm that most people don't come to the office and they then do go into the office, which hurts productivity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's since 2020, that's kind of been the, the, the trend there. Uh, I want to take it back to rate rate hikes. Now we talked about why rate cuts are unfeasible, given the fact that I mean, you're already starting to see kind of the formations of a second wave of inflation come down the pike here. 3.5% was the print this past month, uh, much higher than expected. And, you know, looking at my portfolio, my commodities portfolio, at least, uh, it looks like we're in for another round of supply side, commodity side inflation. Now, with that said, how how feasible is it for the Fed to materially raise rates to a, to a substantial level given the debt burden on their books today? You compare what they had in, 19, in the 1980s with, with Paul Volcker, he didn't have a $33 trillion debt burden to contend with. So what, what do you say to that? Well, it's interesting. It's a good question. But again, remember, the money is funny money now. Okay. It's not gold. It's not silver. It is funny money. You know, the fiat currency system in which we live under, no currency has any backing other than, other than the full faith and credit of the government that, it's, that represents it. So what is the point? That they can devalue the currency anytime I want. You know, everybody comes out with this, the, story, this, the story of, of China. You know, China China is our biggest debt holder, Right. And they go, well, what if China cashes in all their bonds? I said, well, the United States will devalue. China cannot do anything with the bonds they're holding because they know that the United States has the capability of devaluing the currency to begin with. They get nothing. So the, the whole scam of the fiat currency system, which is what causes inflation, it is known as the hidden tax of inflation, right? They continue to roll this out. And that's why we have the issues that we have because the dollar needs to be backed by something. They should never come up to come up the gold standard. Okay, the, everything has to have an equal and fair value because when you when you're trading with error, then it's all meaningless. I mean, you know, when I first started trading, Danny, the Dow was eight hundred. It's forty thousand. What's the difference? Nothing has changed. I mean, I had a better. I made more money per per inflation adjusted in nineteen eighty five than I make today, and I make a hell of a lot more money today than I made then. 
So again, I have to tell you that it's 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 a bunch of garbage because again, the debt is not that big a deal. That's why they keep creating it, okay? Because they know that it's never really going to be paid back, and they keep kicking the can down the road. They've got to make so many more adjustments. You know, you think about it. If you and I live like any government around the globe, okay, we'd be in one of two places: either bankruptcy court or jail, okay. But they don't have that problem. You know, because government does not make money, government makes debt, okay? And it's up to the voters and the citizens of that country to stop them from creating so much debt. But of course, people don't care. They never care until it directly affects them. And by that time, it's way too late. Got a couple things that I want to unpack from what you just said there. You mentioned China. Uh, now, China's been dumping their treasury holdings for about a couple of years now. What is that foreboding? What does that imply? Are we getting ready to get into a conflict with China here? Or is it something else? I, I, I think China is an animal also itself. They have, you know, they have the, they call it the hundred year plan. I think, unfortunately, President Biden has helped them accelerate their hundred year plan. Uh, it is my opinion that, that China is one of the reasons that, now you mentioned commodities earlier and how your portfolio looks like they're going to go higher. And yeah, you look at cocoa, look at some of them, but look at the grain markets, which is the biggest markets in the world. They're getting hammered. Why? The prices at the store are going up everywhere that we're going up. Okay. And yet the United States grain markets are getting hammered. Why? Well, because I think China may be putting their finger on the scale along with Bill Gates, trying to accumulate in a, the farmland. Because remember, if you ain't got food, all the money in the world ain't going to help you. And this is one of the problems that I think is legitimately going on. It's a real concern for me. When Bill Gates started accumulating farmland, it was a real concern. I now think that China may be in the picture. And although they sell treasuries, they also buy new auctions. Okay, they're still our biggest debt holder, and will all, they'll be forced to hold more of our debt because it's the old story. If you owe a bank five thousand, they own you. If you own them five million, they owe, you own them. We own China when it comes to the money side of it, but they don't really care. That's why. They don't care about their people. That's why the human rights are the worst in the, in the world in China. And that's why they turned Hong Kong into another place that is no longer the great Hong Kong that we all remember when it was under British rule. Yeah, I think Bill Gates is now the biggest farm owner in the entire world, no? Just the guy you want to have there, right? Yeah, uh, the yeah. The guy that, that wanted to have uh, put Lojax in your, in your system so they could track it, right? They wanted to put something in the shot, you know, the COVID shots, all, all the garbage that they... All the scams that they are pulling, which is, again, why things are, I think, finally starting to come to a little bit of a head here. So what do you think the likes of Bill Gates and China plan to utilize this farmland for? I mean, is it just purely to make profit off of our food supply or is there something else? To turn the United States into a communist government is really what I think. I mean, we're already headed towards socialism as you as you look at it. And again, if you control the food and you control the money, remember, the only people who don't like communism are the poor okay if you got a lot of money it doesn't affect you the oligarchs aren't affected by it socialism the wealthy aren't affected by it. in fact they benefit from socialist policies so the rich are always for socialism because it doesn't hurt them in fact it benefits them they get to make more money okay it only hurts the the, the middle class and below and th this is the problem what they're doing and if you control the food supply you control everything so you, you don't need money if you control the food and this is what I think that I think that's part of Bill Gates plan. I mean, again, this is this is a way of taking over and, and, and destroying the freedom of Americans. OK, this is what I see is happening in this country. You look at what's going on with the rioting and all the different things that have happened. Look at the amount of racism that has suddenly shown up in the United States of America uh, over the last four years since, oh, since Biden's been president. Again, and not that I'm saying Trump is the greatest thing since sliced bread. What I'm saying is that look what's going on. Look at all the pro-Palestinian protests that are going on. O'Hare Airport today, the Golden Gate Bridge today, all in support against Israel. Now, where is the, Israel's one of our best allies. Where is the fight to help Israel? And again, this is this is what I think they're all working on. And this is a, a big problem because it benefits the very wealthy. Yeah. So going back to the middle class and in food in general. So Larry Fink had this to say uh, the other day. He said that if you were to take in the inflation there, inflation metric and just look at energy and food in the same way that it was calculated uh, a couple decades ago, you're looking at something around 12 percent inflation. Uh, is that kind of what you what you foresee as well? Like, how, how do you how do you parse the current inflation CPI data? I think we're more at 20 percent, to be honest. 20 percent. OK. But again, here's the problem. See, the, the, the way that data is reported 
And this is the problem with government numbers in general, and it's always been the problem, is that they only count food and energy as 4%, okay, of the, of the total number. Well, you're count, when you're counting a refrigerator, which you might buy every 10 or 12 years, or an air conditioner, or a computer, I mean, you buy food and energy every single day, okay? That is the sole biggest cost for any person in the world, other than an emergency that comes up, their biggest ongoing cost, other than their mortgage in an emergency, is food and energy. Those are the things that people care about most. And those are, they have the least amount of weight in those numbers that they give you. Yeah. And then they hedonically adjust them uh, whenever the prices go up too high. So instead, no, of, a, instead of adding in steaks into the, into the basket, they remove it and they add in hamburger meat, for example. It's a, it's a joke. Listen to this. The jobs number, which they keep telling us how good the jobs are. First of all, the jobs number is revised lower. Out of the last 15 jobs reports, 13 have been revised lower. 50% of those jobs that were created were government jobs, which means that the American taxpayer is paying for those jobs. So they make the metrics to fit what they want you to hear. But again, the thing I encourage everybody to do is look into your own spending. You tell me what your inflation is. Don't listen to what the government says. Tell me what you're spending. If you're not spending more, hey, good for you. If you hadn't, if you hadn't had to cut back, hey, good for you. I'm happy for you. But at the end of the day, most people have had to cut back somewhere because <clears throat> the cost is way out of control. Yeah, and, and typically the, the, the simplest way to kind of unravel a central planner's philosophy is just to simply ask them, do, do people respond to incentive? And the answer is obviously yes. You can't really argue against it. So when you kind of apply, apply that question to the inflation numbers, so what is the government incentivized to fudge the numbers on the upside or the downside? They're more inclined to fudge them on the on the downside. And why is that? Well, look at your tax brackets. If you were making hundred thousand dollars in two thousand, well, you're you're being taxed at just about the same level as you are today. But a hundred thousand back then goes a whole lot longer uh, than it does today. So there's different ways. I mean, your social security payments for the seniors is is another example as to why the government is also incentivized to kind of keep the inflation numbers. Uh, on the lower end side. So there's there's plenty of different reasons why when people say, oh, well, why would they do that? Well, there's, I mean, there's two reasons right there. They're, well, they're really running a Ponzi scheme. Is what, what they're, they're running a legalized Ponzi scheme. That's what Social Security is. That's what the government is because they can continue to create new money to satisfy old debt. Okay, at the same time, they can devalue the currency and they can make the numbers look what they want so they don't get the raise. I mean, listen, it's so screwed up that the retirement age should really be somewhere in the high 70s, if not 80, because the original Social Security system that was built by Roosevelt, which was built correctly, the average living age was 62. So retirement age was at 65, figuring that most of the people would be dead and wouldn't collect so there'd be money, plenty of money. But now, not only is it people living well past that, but the government uses that money, okay, and it's not going to be there because there's not enough for it. And until they raise the la the age of retirement, there's not gonna be enough for social security because there's they, they, they're, they're, people are far living. There's not enough employees to pay the people that are collecting right now. Yeah, so speaking of money, let's go ahead and pivot over to what real money is. Some people might call gold. Gold's been at, last time I checked today, just a few minutes ago, it's $2,400. Gold seems to be making a new all-time high almost daily now. Now, I know we've got all this stuff going on in the Middle East, but is there anything else that you think is driving the rally in gold today? No, yeah, I think that I think that people are waking up. I, listen, I'm a big supporter of gold. I, listen, I'm a big supporter of equities. I'm a big supporter of gold. I think everybody should have, you know, 5 to 10% of their net worth tied up in gold and silver, maybe platinum. Uh, but again, now that, by the way, just be clear, I'm talking about physical. I'm not talking about that paper crap that's out there because I don't think there's enough gold or silver in the world to cover the amount of paper that's written on it. Okay. I'm talking about real hard physical silver, physical gold. I think that a, we may need it as a currency. Again, people are starting to realize you're starting to see some fear there. I think you're starting to see as inflation rises, so does gold. Gold does typically will outpace inflation. Okay. You look at look at what's happening now. The U.S. dollar is flying, and so is gold. That's a, an unusual characteristic at the same time. But it's happening because there is some buyers below it, and I do see gold. I thought if, when I, if you saw my kid going to I said I thought twenty five hundred this year, and I, it's maybe it might be twenty five hundred this week. 
But yeah. again, I, I don't look at the gold as a fair asset, although many do. I think gold is a hard asset. It's like a home. It'll appreciate in value and it'll have times where it'll appreciate faster than others. And I think this is one of those times that the combination of the stock market weakening, the, 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 the Bitcoin, uh, the cryptocurrency world, which I happen to think is real, okay, that is also creating some more money into the gold market as well, because now I think people are recognizing that maybe they do need to have some alternative ways to buy and create money that they may need. And again, if, if, the, if the governments go down, if something happens, okay, you're going to need something and you need physical metals, something that is negotiable that you can use because a dollar bill may someday be worthless. Yeah, I mean, I found it extremely telling that when push came to shove over the weekend, when you had Iran attack Israel, that people didn't pile on to Bitcoin. People sold Bitcoin. And although this isn't a clear indication of what gold would have done, you did see the stable coin um, surrounding gold. I forgot what it was called, but it rallied all the way up to $3,000. Now, I'm not saying that gold would have done the same thing, but I just thought that was extremely telling. So when you say, oh, wh wh when you see people arguing between gold and Bitcoin as to which one is the better safe haven, I think we've stress tested that now. And we can clearly see that, it's, that the winner is gold. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to disagree, but I can't necessarily jump out and agree either. I don't mm. know. Okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough on crypto. I understand it, obviously, to a trading standpoint. I understand to what it is. It, it does have the one issue with me that it doesn't have necessarily a real backing other than a mathematical formula. Uh, but again, it certainly is nice if you were if you were trying to escape China, you get, you ain't walking out with a thousand ounces of gold. Okay, you're gonna have to get it out some other way, which would be through the crypto world. I think they're actually a great blend together. And I think if you also looked at gold overnight, gold was much lower overnight as well throughout all the crisis. It did rally later, but it was down over thirty-five dollars at one time today. So again, I, I again, I'm not disagreeing, but I'm not necessarily agreeing with you because I think that they're both equal. But for today, right now, everybody will take a piece of some gold from you. So I, I give you that part of your argument. Gotcha. Well, hey, let's jump over to silver. Silver's been making waves as well. It's sitting close to twenty-nine dollars now. If you look at the gold to silver ratio, uh, it's actually been going down, meaning that silver's been outperforming gold here. Of course, gold is at an all-time high. Silver is still well below its all-time high, $50. So what's your view on silver? Is silver ready to make a run for it? I think so. I think silver, I've been, I've been wrong here for the last year and a half. I thought silver was going to get into the 30s. And we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I do think silver is ready to run. And I do think the ratio is way out of whack. Uh, and it, I think that we're going to, I think we're going to get a big test in the next couple of weeks because I think we're going to push 230 Let's see if we can break through it and go. But I do think, obviously, the ratio is way out of whack. It's ridiculous. But you do have, of course, the they want to call it market manipulation. I don't necessarily agree with the terminology. But we know that a lot of the banks are always sellers of silver, trying to keep the pressure down because you know they want to stay short silver because they own all the silver bars, right? So they're, they're kind of trying to hold prices. But I think that at some point, we're going to break out of this range. And I think that the gold-silver ratio is going to get way come way down. I mean, it was at one time at 92 Okay, it's supposed to be the original terms were 15. So I think somewhere in between there will be. But I would I would think silver is going to outperform gold, but I think they're both going to do pretty well. And I would not be surprised to see silver get into the mid-30s by the end of the year. Isn't that what you want in a gold rally? It's a silver to outperform gold? Isn't that a sign of more confidence and speculators kind of going down the the risk curve? And, and No, I agree with you. I, I agree with that. I, again, I, I, I like to see... An equal mix. I'd like to see platinum catch up because I think mm -hmm. platinum is very severely under underpriced here as well. But it's been, you know, if you remember at one time platinum was over gold, now it's less than a, almost a third of gold. Yeah. What about copper? Copper has actually been stealthily moving up. I've seen copper. It, I think it's at four dollars and thirty cents at the moment. Yeah, no I, one's I, making any commotion over copper. Doctor Copper is the barometer of the economy. So what's you, you, what do you make be, copper now? I, I honestly I can't answer. I we're long copper. OK, but I don't buy I'm not long it because I like it as a stored investment. You know, in China used to be able to borrow against copper. That was one of the, the borrowing factors which kept the prices high. I'm, I'm quite frankly, it's going straight up. It's extremely overbought. I can't argue with the tape. I can't argue with the market, but it doesn't make any sense because I think the economy is weak. I think we're we're either in a recession or headed for a recession. I don't care what the markets are doing. The stock market's doing. 
it's not logical unless again somebody's got their finger and you know if you have enough money you can afford he can force certain types of moves but when i look at the economy you know i always look at lumber which is an illiquid product to trade but it's something that i look at to see what if it's being and lumber is coming way down and it doesn't make sense because i think building is slowing because again why would i get a deal on my rates you know half what the market value is on rates so to me there's something fishy there and certainly i'm not telling anybody to sell copper at these levels but don't be surprised if in six months from now copper's at three dollars i mean my suspicion and let me know if you think i'm onto something or not my suspicion is that we're it's telling us that we're in a stagflationary environment, meaning that to expect more inflation from a commodity side of you, but then a weaker economy, a weaker market in general. I agree. I, I think that's an, of all the all the flations, that's the worst one. Yep. Stagflation, right? And then of course interest rates go spiking higher. If you if anybody's old enough to remember the late seventies when Jimmy Carter was president and interest rates were at twenty percent, okay, that's what stagflation does. It is, it it, it, it no jobs, no money, high cost very tough for people to live. Yeah. It's the worst of both worlds. Uh, what about the miners? Are you uh, interested in the miners at all? And why do you think the miners have lacked so far behind the physical precious metals? Well, I think because for part of the reason is because I do believe that their paper is worthless. Okay. In general, uh, I'm not a big buyer of miners. In fact, I don't play any miners except I play uh, a first majestic in silver. Uh, but that's a cheap, like a penny stock that I like to play with. And Nugget, which is a leverage ETF, which is to the miners. But I don't, again, I'm not a paper guy in gold. I, I don't think that, you know, if I'm going to trade in the gold paper markets, I'm going to trade the futures markets. Okay. I'm not, I'm not buying a miner. There's too many games that go on in those companies. And, and I don't, I, I can't get a good handle on it because you don't have, we make this product. It costs X to make this product. And here it is. The numbers are always fishy when it comes to oil companies. And when it comes to mining companies. So to me, for my money, typically I stay away from those unless I have more information. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we've covered the precious metals. Let's move over to oil. Oil has been holding steady now. It's about $85. Uh, gold's been moving up, but oil has been steady. Uh, typically during times like this, they move kind of con in conjunction with one another, but it seems like a decoupling between gold and oil. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I'm not really seeing that as much. I mean, oil is up, you know, 12%. Over the last three weeks, four weeks, uh, you know, gold's up. I think they're both going up together. And I think that you've had a little bit of pressure. I, you know, Biden continues to drain the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is trying to I think it's down to forward. 17 days now. You know, what's that? I think it's down to 17 days of uh, usage. Right. And again, that's a totally, that's supposed to be wartime oil. So, but at the end of the day, you know, I just paid 440 in Las Vegas for gas, which is a little bit higher than other places in the country because they wouldn't allow them to put a pipeline in. They have to truck it in. But Long and short is, I think that they're both acting well. And I think that oil is going to be, go back well over 100 again. Uh, I think that you remember, markets don't always correlate today. At some point, the correlation will come back to it. And that's what I would expect to see. I would expect to see a big rally in oil. And I think if these, now you asked me earlier about the Middle East, if these troubles can persist in the Middle East, you could see oil take off. But right now, uh, I'm, just, I'm just looking at the formation real quick while I'm talking to you, because I can tell you, I even have to put my glasses on. Hold on a second. I'm going to tell you what the the backwardation or contangle part of it is, which is tells you what the fear factor really is in the oil market right now. Uh, May oil or, or June oil is eighty five dollars. You go out to uh, October oil or September oil is eighty two ninety. Mm. So there's the right now there's a fear premium in the oil. Okay, gotcha. So it's called backwardation, where the front is the most expensive and the and the, and the back is cheaper. Okay, it should be the reverse, right? It should be in contango, which goes out and the, the curve. It's like almost like the yield curve in bonds and notes right now. The curve is down. Short-term money is much more expensive than long-term money, which is, is which isn't doesn't make sense on its own. So it seems like it's priced in political risk. Yeah, it, they're pricing in fear. Okay, when you see when you see a a, mar, a product like oil go into backwardation, that means that they're only trading the front month. They're trading the fear month. Just like if you remember. I don't know, four or five years ago, when we went negative. That was only in the front month because there was no place to store it. Right. And the people that owned it had to get out. But th there's a lot of the little things to the commodity markets that you can you can take off of what they call backward action and contango. Gotcha. Well, hey, before we sign off, I want to ask you uh, just a personal trading question. What have been your best and worst trades in your life? Well, 
Um, I don't know. I think my, my, my best trade was probably uh, 1984 when, when I was on the floor and uh, uh, I was <laughs> supposed to go to the Super Bowl. And it was the weekend of the Super Bowl, obviously. And I decided not to go because I could see something was going on in the market. And I ended up buying over a thousand puts. At, like at, I, there's a long, longer story to it, but at, I sold them for three times what I bought them for basically in 20 minutes. Wow. Uh, and my worst trade, I don't know, getting caught short puts by mistake because one of my clerks miscounted in 1987. <laughs> so, well, well, Hey Todd, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, any concluding thoughts and where can people find you? Uh, thanks Danny. Listen, they can reach me at bubbatrading.com. Uh, they can email me directly. If they have any questions at bubba, bubba And if it's okay with you, I've written a couple of books. I'm willing to give one of them away to your listeners for free. It's a PDF file. I'll happy to be happy to send them. Just email me direct at bubba at bubba And it's my Bubba's guide to trading options. Excellent. Well, Hey, go follow uh, Todd, Bubba, Bubba trading. And uh, if you enjoyed this content, be sure to give us a like comment down below. Let me know what you think. Share this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, 